Greetings, uh, this is Dr. Barnes, and uh, this is um, a little bit different video. Um, this is not a video about trauma, this is a video about really the fundamentals of recovery, some of the really basic ideas that I want to make sure that you're going to understand as you're going through the process of treatment. A lot of what I'm going to talk about, or some of what I'm going to talk about, Dr. Schuler will do in much greater detail than I will do. So when he's up every once a month or so, and he'll you'll get to see his presentation, which is uh, informative and entertaining, I have to say. So um, this also uh, will be a presentation where uh, whoever's facilitating the video, there will be some opportunities to stop the video and to begin to have some discussion with you all. But it's going to be really designed to look at, you know, is it a disease? Um, you know, what is a disease? Uh, how does it work? And, uh, you know, that's one of the big debates for a lot of clients when they come in is that, you know, we have built our program around a chronic disease model. And for clients who, um, you know, maybe kind of see it as uh, trauma, and it certainly is impacted by trauma, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those things. So, and so I'll define what, an, what a disease is, how addiction meets that, but also really taking a look at um, you know, really the, the recovery process as well. So, so the first question would be, who becomes an addict? Like, who becomes addicted to alcohol or drugs? And what are the factors that cause those? And there are three of them, to be quite specific. The first is to have a genetic predisposition, which means that someone in your family, whether it be in your parents' lineage, um, uh, you know, a lot of times clients will say, well, neither of my parents had an addiction issue. But when we expand back uh, to prior generations, we find that grandparents had addiction or um, they had some kind of trauma history or they had a history of some kind of chronic medical condition that impacted how the parents parent. And so um, if someone in your family has a history of addiction, um, some kind of genetic predisposition, so... Um, when we, you know, we really hoped when they did the Human Genome Project that um, when they broke down all the genes in the body that they would tell us what it was that causes addiction from a genetic perspective. And what they really told us was that there isn't any one gene that causes addiction, but that there are a number of genes that have an influence in whether someone gets it. And that the environment what we call epigenetics, how the environment that we live in um, will kind of turn genes on or turn genes off uh, that will make it more likely that you become um, addicted to a substance or to a process. And I think the best way to describe that is that they've done a lot of studies with um, identical twins who were uh, adopted at birth and where one kid would go to a family that had um, addiction issues and one would go to a family that didn't. Now this was not intentional, this was sort of post uh, research where they kind of looked at lives of kids afterwards. But what they found was that two identical twins would have the identical genetic makeup. And that if they were born into a family that had a history of addiction, which is that predis uh, predisposition, and the kid that went to the family that had trauma and addiction and mental health issues um, typically became addicted themselves. And the kid who went to the family that had none of those pre, pre kind of conditions uh, generally did not. And so clearly a genetic predisposition sets a foundation that if the circumstances in our life are um, uh, appropriate, or inappropriate, however you want to look at it, um, that um, that environmental stressor uh, will actually activate that genetic predisposition so that someone does become um, eas more easily addicted to a, a substance or a pro uh, process. And we'll talk about process addiction in a minute. The second, and this is the one that is really becoming very popular these days, the idea that if someone is self-medicating for a trauma, or if someone is self-medicating for depression or anxiety or some other kind of um, you know, physiological or psychological condition, and um, we really believe that this is a, a major factor for 
most of our clients, and that's why our program focuses on trauma to the degree that it does. But it doesn't, uh, um, not everyone has trauma, and to say that, um, you know, addiction is a symptom of trauma, I think is a, is a pretty significant overstatement. And there are people that are making that overstatement. Uh, and I'll explain that in a second. And then the third one is individuals who live in an environment where alcohol and drug use is the norm. Excessive use is the norm, uh, where kind of there are limited pressures to moderate. So families where there's a lot of conflict, families where there's um, you know a parent in the home <clears throat> who drinks alcoholically or uses substances, that that there becomes a more kind of a learned process. Uh, where that is normal and then um, you know, ultimately if you look at the blue box on the right of this it says each of these groups once the mesolimbic dopamine system in the brain which we're going to talk about in a minute not to get too technical but it's important to understand that there is a place in the brain that is impacted by drugs and alcohol that actually creates the addictive process so that it, it gets hijacked, which basically means that the addiction um, uh, causes um, you know, biological, psychological, social, and behavioral symptoms. And we'll uh, review those in a second, too. And i got a dog right at my feet here. Um, so it's really important to kind of stop for a second and think, where, you know, where do I fit in that? Like, did I grow up in a family... Do I understand what my grandparents' um, addiction history was like? Do I understand the environment that my parents grew up in? Um, you know, we always say that you know parents can't give kids what they don't have, and so if parents grew up, even if they don't have an addiction themselves, but if they grew up in a in a family where there was a lack of attachment, or it was kind of unsafe to get their own needs met, or um, they were dealing with the conflict associated with uh, a family member's addiction or trauma. That, you know, that becomes the norm for them, and that, that's how they kind of raise us. So, um, if you want to take a second and kind of stop the video and look at these three uh, areas and see where do they fit for you, that would be now would be a good time to do that. So, if we look at what the definition of the word disease is. I basically um, said, hey Siri, uh, how do you define the word addiction? Um, <laughs> so uh, this is what Siri said, a, disor a disorder of structure and function, and both of those are um, real uh, when it comes to addiction, structure being, being structure in the limbic system of the brain, and function being uh, be our behavior that produces specific signs and symptoms, we'll cover those in a few slides, and that affect a specific location of the brain. And the mesolimbic reward system of the brain um, is right here. If you look at this slide, the mesolimbic system is, um, so you know, this is the brain stem, this is the part where the nervous system goes down to the uh, arms and legs and to the you know, our peripheral nervous system. Um, uh, this is the, the midbrain, the uh, limbic system, uh, that has a, a lot to do with monitoring our environment for safety, uh, monitoring um, a lot of the systems in our body to turn things on and turn things off. Uh, memories are created in here, the very beginnings of memories. And so this is where um, there's a little blue button here called the ventral tegmental area. You don't need to remember what it is. You just need to remember that this is where the neurotransmitter dopamine is created. And so when we do any of the things over here, um, eating, um, uh, drinking water, hydrating, um, working on safety, uh, our fight or flight system uh, is um, managed out of this part of our brain. You know, we take care of our family. Uh, we engage in sex to continue the species, uh, nurture our young. Anytime we do any of these core survival needs, this little blue area, the ventral tegmental area, releases dopamine, which travels along a pathway 
to the nucleus accumbens, and that's when the dopamine is processed and we feel pleasure. And in this, and in, in this context, pleasure isn't always feeling good. Pleasure may be feeling full or feeling um, that needs are met or the term satiated is, is often the case. And it's interesting to understand that this dopamine um, kind of reward system was not identified until 1954. And at the time, these two scientists, James Old and Peter Milner, um, were a, in Montreal, and they thought they found a cure for depression. And they thought, wow, this if we can learn how to manage this part of our brain, then people will always feel good. People will always feel um, full. And the thing that is really important to understand is this center is so powerful. And so what scientists do is they put electrodes down into rats' brains and gave them a little button to push so that they could push it whenever they felt the need to feel better. And um, <clears throat> uh, if you can think about what do you think happened to those rats? Every one of them died because they would push that bar and release dopamine and get that kind of bump in feeling uh, pleasure or feeling full um, until they died. So they would quit eating. And so when we put addiction in here, and addiction kind of takes over this process, um, but it also impacts this big area up here, the pre but this is called the prefrontal cortex. And this is where memories are stored, uh, impulse control happens, <clears throat> the ability to manage our emotions. Uh, uh, you know, you've probably seen the marble map. Um, looks looks like like that. And so it's that part of the brain that manages the sympathetic or the fight or flight system and the freeze system, the dissociative system. So again not to become not to be too technical about it uh, but that's the part of the brain that is impacted and it takes over so many of the other systems and we'll talk about those in a minute so um the best definition so if we really want to go to is is addiction a disease you go to really trusted um, medical environments and this is the mayo clinic one of the you know, most significant hospital systems in the world and it says the drug addiction is also called substance abuse a disease that affects a, brain, a person's brain and behavior that leads to an inability to control the use of legal or illegal drugs um, you know the person who becomes addicted will continue to use uh, that drug despite the harm that it causes the second one is the american society for addiction medicine which is called ASAM, which really, um, um, when, when you're in detox, and then you're in residential, and then you move to partial hospital, and then you move to intensive outpatient, it is the American Asso uh, Society of Addiction Medicine that has outlined those various levels of care. And so that's what um, insurance companies use to decide whether you, um, you know, what level of treatment you need. So a lot of times clients will say, you know, why am I not getting enough days to get what I need? And um, so those ASAM criteria and the insurance companies, um, in some cases, um, insurance companies don't provide adequate care. And then other people are upset because they're getting all these other days and other people are moving on and they get mad um, about having to stay longer. And so again, uh, some insurance companies are really um, appropriately aware of the needs of clients. So here's what the uh, ASAM folks say, that it is a primary chronic and progressive disease. Primary means that <clears throat> someone doesn't develop an addiction because of conflict in their, uh, you know, within their marital relationship, or that um, they don't develop addiction as a uh, and if I just fix my trauma, my addiction is going to go away. That when there's addiction and there's trauma, those become what we call co-occurring disorders. And so you have to work with both at the same time. And the old way of thinking was you had to work on the addiction, and then you could work on the trauma. And now we're beginning to realize that 
if you don't work on them together, um, and I'm not talking about necessarily telling the whole story, I'm talking about safety and learning how to manage your emotions and identify how you feel, things that we'll show um, in a second, uh, uh, that the person's pretty unlikely to stay sober. So we work on those together. Um, it's chronic, and unlike a disease where there's a cure or medicine you can take to make it go away or to heal it, um, addiction becomes a chronic disease that once that limbic system of the brain has been impacted that um, and these neuro uh, these kind of neuro pathways in your brain have been developed you know you can weaken those pathways and build really healthy strong vibrant new uh, thought processes and behavior patterns that are associated with recovery but that the old ones never fully go away so that if things get stressful enough or you kind of get away from the way you've been kind of living in recovery, relapse becomes the reactivation of that old kind of brain system that was part of the addiction. So we call that a chronic disease. So other chronic diseases would be like multiple sclerosis. Um, you know, Parkinson's becomes chronic once it develops. Hypertension, um, the one that's probably most closely associated with addiction would be like diabetes, where there um, are frequent relapses with diabetes, meaning people eat well and get really healthy, and then they get away from those patterns, and then they relapse and go back to eating the way they did before, and they have all kinds of problems, such as loss of limbs and feet and the need for amputations. It's a pretty, pretty serious condition. And then the last one is it's progressive. Progressive means that it gets worse, that it has a beginning, a middle, and then an end. And I'm going to show you a, a picture here of um, a good representation of the progression of that illness. And so this is called Jelinek's Curve. This was developed way back in the 1940s, and it was really designed for people with alcohol use disorders and uh, for alcoholism. And it begins to show the, the beginning phase, you know, occasional relief drinking, uh, moving into more constant, regular uh, relief drinking to increased tolerance where it takes more to get the same uh, level of intoxication, the same effect, uh, starting to have blackouts. And so, um, you know, you can kind of walk slowly through this list and begin to recognize the illness getting more and more severe. The crucial phase, the sort of the phase where most people get into treatment for the first time, is really the beginning of um, pretty significant, the beginnings of biological, medical conditions, family problems, work-related problems, um, uh, neglecting food, the, the hijacking of the brain uh, to, to make addiction more important than other things, and then the last phase, the chronic phase, and this is where there are um, pretty uh, pretty significant um, um, biological, psychological, social, behavioral implications and where you know, people may begin to have cirrhosis of the liver, people may have um, you know, very chronic uh, legal problems or other medical problems. And then <clears throat> in the process then, the person goes to treatment, Sometimes for the first time, I've had clients that have been to treatment 15 times that got sober, but finally beginning to kind of understand the disease process and then moving um, into a, a recovery process, beginning with abstinence and then moving into sobriety and then really into a more healthy family life, work life, financial life, those kinds of things. We'll talk about those. But the thing that's dangerous about this, to be very honest, is this is designed to show a timeline from like beginning to end. If your drug of choice is opiates, these symptoms are going to be a little different, but there's still going to be a kind of a beginning, a crucial phase, and a chronic phase. But uh, opiates are so much more addictive, and people become addicted uh, to opiates and methamphetamine in such a rapid form that it might look like this for um, a, a certain drugs where the addictive process happens quickly so that the timeline 
for addiction may be years, but for opiates it may be days. It may be, you know, there's some research that says that a person can become addicted to opiates in less than three times using it to where the body begins to, to become dependent on that and the cravings become really high. So different drugs of choice are going to have the same severity in the, in the progression of the illness, but it may take a very short period of time where other drugs may take you know, several years to get to this place. The process is the same, but the time frames can be significantly different. When we're talking about progression of the illness, it's also important to include family in this process. And that families will often say, if you get sober, then you know everyone can just go back to normal. And the problem with that statement is that the normal in their mind is back here. Well, that's not very realistic. And so do you think your family has had to make adjustments to both help you, but also to live with the uncertainty of addiction over the course of either years or months or however long they've been dealing with it. And the reality is that as w whether it's a long progression or whether it's a very rapid progression, as long as you begin to show progression or a worsening of the, of the condition, your family is making constant changes to try to live with it and help you. And so when you get sober, there's no going back to here because not only are you different, but so are they. And so some people have asked us, well, why do you do this kind of extensive family program? Well, we do it because if your family doesn't get on board with the change process, it's going to make, the, when you get out of treatment, they're going to be treating you in the same way that they treated you here. And that makes it significantly harder to get sober. So that's really all I'm going to talk about families at this point. But I think it's important to understand that you cannot separate the family process from, from the recovery process. So going back to ASAM, <clears throat> you, know, um, you know, when we say it's a progressive disease, 11% 11, uh, 11 of the American population, and there's different studies that will say with 9 to 11% um, of the um, American population um, has an active addiction or is in recovery from an active addiction. So one in every 11 people, uh, you know, let's just say one in 10. So I always think of, you know, if you think about the Broncos football stadium, and to think every 10th person has an active addiction, at some point along that continuum, it begins to show you just how severe this problem is in the American culture. And so when clients say, you know, I just want to be normal. Well, you know, one in 10 is about as normal as you can get um, in terms of um, this is a problem that is um, virtually every family has it somewhere in that process. It's potentially fatal. Um, 116 to 120 people die every day from opiate uh, overdose. Another 240, 260 die from alcohol-related issues every day. Um, just got word of one of our graduates um, who passed away. Um, I'm unsure what the conditions were, but from an accident. And um, you know, we're hoping that it was not a, a death related to his addiction, but you just don't know. Um, another symptom is a pathological pursuit for reward and relief, which is basically saying, once we learn how to activate this part of our brain, it begins to hijack our, our memories and our experiences so that when we feel bad, we immediately begin thinking about, well, I know a good way to feel good. And so that, that it, it hijacks the process to use it for um, processes in our life or behaviors or circumstances in people's lives that aren't really related to survival, but are more related to uh, self-medication or relief. And so that, again, is truly a biological process. Um, inability to consistently abstain. If you could have stopped, you wouldn't be sitting watching this video. 
uh, impairment of behavioral control, craving, failure to recognize problems, interpersonal struggles and relationships. Again, um, no one gets to us. I've never had a client in 40 years of working in the field that said, you know, I don't have any problems associated with my drug or alcohol use, but can you help me stop? That, that doesn't make any sense. And so it's these are the things that upset families. These are the things that make clients want to stop. Uh, dysfunctional emotional response. Uh, we, you know, why do we have a biosound room? Well, so that you can get on the biosound bed to learn how to manage um, you know, uh, emotions like anger and anxiety. Um, why do we do mindfulness? We do that so you can learn how to uh, manage or create a more functional emotional response. And then the last one is relapse. Relapse. Uh, no one wants to talk about that, but relapse is actually not an event. It's a process. Uh, I'll show you a, a slide here. Um, it's interesting how most people tend to think of relapse as being here, like it's an event. Um, um, you know, if, if a person goes into treatment, they go in, into recovery and they relapse, people see that as this catastrophic event. And it can be, that's where a lot of the deaths happen. But if we really were to look at recovery rather than as this part at the end, but recovery as a process, where you're constantly kind of struggling, maybe going into treatment, learning, developing skills and coping, and you begin to feel really bad, better, and then yeah, some things you still need to work on and begin to struggle because of a, a problem at work or other kinds of problems, uh, and then uh, maybe relapse at that point, and then kind of, again, go into treatment and grow and do better and then struggle. And so, um, like any chronic disease, if um, if you don't do the things that you need to do to prevent yourself from using the substance that activates that disease, um, you'll probably go back to old behaviors. You still have that pathway in your brain that makes that possible. And so um, you know, relapse can happen at any place along this way. But one of the things we're finding is that um, when clients and families are on the same page, that they manage those relapses so much better. These are the actual symptoms uh, that we um, look at when we're trying to decide whether someone needs treatment. And um, again, this will be a good place. I'll go through the, the first page of these pretty quickly. And this might be a place where whoever's facilitating this lecture um, can stop and go through these and really explain them in maybe greater detail. And you can begin to identify, wow, I, that's one I, rec I recognize in myself. But it's really important to understand uh, that if you're going to accept this disease process or accept your addiction, you have to understand what you're accepting. So um, again, what you'll see is these are uh, almost all symptoms associated with the ability to either control the um, addiction or symptoms associated with uh, how life begins to change in order to maintain it. So the first one, substance taken in larger amounts over longer periods of time than intended. And one of the things we, we talk about is loss of control, the idea that um, sometimes in, in the more earlier stages, um, a person can control it and manage it and it looks perfectly normal. And then random times um, it becomes a huge problem. They get a DUI or they have an argument or a fight or something. So they begin to realize that when they step back from it, that over the course of time, you know, I've begun to lose control more than I've been able to manage control. Uh, second, persistent attempts to um, cut down or to control substance use. And that idea of, um, you know, for a lot of people, they've never tried to cut down. So they'll say, well, I'm, I've never done that. But that's a whole other situation. But that idea of how many times have you tried to either cut down and, you know, I need to be able to control it. And I think uh, a guy um, um, wrote a book um, that's, I can't think of it right now. Um, but what he said was our society, particularly with alcohol, um, 
puts pressure on people to manage their addiction. And so for a lot of folks, um, when they begin to realize that this is becoming a problem, that kind of the, the man rules, it's why we do the men's program, um, would tell you, um, you know, you have to be able to control this so that you can prove to everyone that you don't have a problem. And if that's the case, and this disease process is actually there, then uh, this becomes a source of shame as you try to control it and you can't. Um, or a sense of guilt because of the behaviors that come uh, with using when you were trying to cut down. Third one, um, a great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain the substance, use the substance, or recover from the effects of the substance. It's interesting, I'm from Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, I believe is the only um, state in the country that still sells liquor um, in what's called a state store, so that you cannot buy liquor in Pennsylvania um, from any store other than one that is owned by the state of Pennsylvania. And when COVID hit and the government shut down, they closed all the liquor stores and they never thought of the consequences for people who are uh, dependent on it. And so people were driving from Pennsylvania to like New Jersey and Ohio and West Virginia to buy large quantities of alcohol so that you know they didn't have to make that trip all the time. And so that idea of how much time was spent trying to get it and use it and then recover from it. And so that idea, uh, when we think about other drugs um, that are not bought in stores and uh, the, the extremes that people go to to make sure that they have what they need. Four, craving or strong desire to urge uh, or urge to use. Uh, cravings, cues, whatever you call them. Um, and we'll talk about those as being biologically necessary and, and how they happen in a minute. Uh, recurrent substance use. Uh, and a, uh, fa a failure uh, of major roles that um, addiction is getting in the way with uh, in the way of being successful at work, at school, marriages and relationships falling apart. So um, you know, promises made, promises broken, um, inability to get to where they're supposed to be, um, putting priority on using and blaming everyone else for those processes are a part of that. Six, continued substance use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems. You know, um, in most cases, you know, if you have a major consequence and you step back and you think about it and you say, well, you know, I should probably not do that. But because of our defenses, denial, or rationalizing, um, intellectualizing, um, we, you know, people begin to spend more time justifying their use rather than beginning to look at uh, the consequences of it. Seven, social, occupational, or recreational activities given up or reduced. That's one of the things that a lot of people will say is that they used to hike and fish and do all these uh, wonderful things for self-care and um, now they just hole up in their house and use. Um, I used to, you know, I've lost so many jobs because of this. And, you know, loss of marriages, relationships, you know, those kinds of things. So that the important activities of our lives, people's lives, uh, begin to take a second um, kind of uh, place to the substances. And then uh, eight, recurrent use in situations that would be physically hazardous, driving, trying, uh, using at work, those kinds of things. Um, substance use uh, continued uh, despite having uh, persistent physical or psychological problems, um, you know, when doctors say, if you use again, you know, you're going to die, and I hear that all the time, and I always think about, um, you know, there's a double message in that, that most people don't die when they use the next time, and so they begin to doubt the medical environment or the medical profession, like they don't really know what they're talking about, but the, over the course of time, that people continue to use even though they have you know, alcohol hepatitis or something along that line. And then the last two things that are really important are tolerance. And tolerance is basically saying that the nervous system has become so uh, accustomed to using that um, 
it takes more and more and more of the drug to get the same effect that it used to create. And um, what's really interesting is um, in this in this chronic phase, one of the symptoms is a, a decrease in tolerance. And that really is basically saying that because the liver, this is more for alcohol, but for any drug that is um, kind of processed out of the body through the liver, as the liver becomes impaired, um, tolerance um, uh, goes way up because, um, you know, or, or, so tolerance goes up as the disease is getting worse, and then as the liver becomes impaired, tolerance goes back down because it takes so much longer for the um, alcohol to be detoxed out of the body um, that um, you know, a person can begin to feel in intoxicated even with sh small amounts of use. And then the last one is withdrawal, the idea of, you know, if you're with us, you probably have experienced withdrawal symptoms associated with um, the alcohol or drugs being out of your body. And so again, this would be a good time for the facilitator to stop go through those uh, in detail, answer any questions, and uh, uh, help clients begin to take a look at that. And so I'm going to talk about the brain in very simple, simple uh, way as I can. So there are three, so neurotransmitters are what gets passed from one nerve to the next nerve to activate that. So. Um, when this nerve is activated, it releases neurotransmitters into this very tiny, what's called the synaptic cleft. And then when those neurotransmitters go across that little space, there are little receptor sites on the next gene, or on the next nerve, and when there's enough of the chemical in those receptor sites, that nerve fires and does the exact same thing to the nerves that are connected to it. And so, um, um, so there are three neurotransmitters that are really important. The first one is dopamine, and that's what we talked about as far as giving us pleasure. The second one is serotonin. And so people will often ask, well, why, why are you giving me an antidepressant like when I'm in treatment? Well, shouldn't I be off of all medication? So one of the things that are seen um, with people with active addiction is as this part of the brain releases more and more dopamine because the person is drinking or using more and more of a drug, that we see a reduction in serotonin. And a reduction in serotonin creates depression. And what it really creates, and so you know, if you really think about what are the symptoms of depression, one of the symptoms uh, of it is a, a lack of feeling full, a lack of feeling satisfied, a lack of what we would call satiation. And I would ask you to think about when you're really hungry or you're really tired and you're being asked to do things and there's a general lack of um, satisfaction, irritability, those kinds of things. And so that as the addiction gets worse and the dopamine is going up, the serotonin is going down. So that if, if what, what the dopamine does is give us a sense of pleasure, when the alcohol dr or drugs wear off, the lack of serotonin creates a sense of depression or a sense of dis-ease or um, dissatisfaction or um, being upset. And so um, when someone comes into treatment and they're, um, the the drug that gives the sense of pleasure is taken away, they're often dealing with a lack of serotonin because um, of the process. Remember, as dopamine goes up, serotonin goes down. It takes a while for that serotonin level to go back up so that you can begin to feel pleasure again, so you can begin to feel full, satiated, happy, satisfied. And so for a lot of folks, an antidepressant allows that serotonin to come back to levels um, to where you know you may not need it down the road um, you may not need it once your recovery has been um, kind of more 
are practiced and you become more skilled in the recovery process. The third one is a, is a, a neurotransmitter called glutamate. And glutamate is made in the same part of the brain, this nucleus accumbens, that dopamine is processed in. And um, what d uh, glutamate does is that um, it really makes dopamine like rocket fuel. It, it, it like makes the impact of dopamine greater. Um, and so you feel even more pleasure the more those two neurotransmitters kind of interact with each other. But that's not the important part of it. The important part is that what glutamate does, and so if you think about using, and let's just say you drink, you, you, alcohol is your drug of choice, and you drink in a bar. There are certain sensory experiences of being in that bar. There are probably alcohol signs in the bar that you see on a regular basis. There's certain, uh, there may be food that's served in that bar. There may be a bartender that you see every day. There may be other people that sit at the bar at the same time every day. Um, I once had a client who talked about um, when he would leave his job and he put his hands on the steering wheel of his truck that he began to feel better because it was sort of like, um, you know, now I'm going to go do what I need to do to you know, feel better. And so what glutamate does is takes all of those sensory experiences that you're experiencing while you're using and connects them to the release of dopamine. So when you put your hands on the steering wheel of your vehicle as you're getting ready to go to the bar, it starts to release dopamine into your brain, so you begin to feel better. As you're driving down the road and you see the bar sign that you've seen you know, a thousand times, it's releasing dopamine so that you feel better. Um, when you walk in and you have the smell of the food, it releases dopamine so you feel better. When you see the bartender that you talk sports with or whatever it is that you do, it releases dopamine. So before you've ever taken the first drink, you have been releasing dopamine in anticipation of that first drink. And that's the beginning of craving. So when a lot of people will say to us, um, you know, I can still go to the bar and I can still hang out with my friends. They're such a part of my social network that I, I, know, I know I can't drink. I know I can't do that. But you cannot trick your brain into, like, reducing those experiences that you have and so um, people go with the greatest of intention of not using but all of the things I just talked about have been releasing dopamine into the system and so uh, it makes using exponentially or significantly higher now once someone's been sober for you know a few years they may feel more comfortable being around um, alcohol or whatever drug of choice um, and that, that may be a different story. But initially, that's why we would tell you that's a terrible idea. And so, um, you know, for many people, um, you know, uh, who are using other drugs, um, you know, I always think about like a dealer's car. Or if your phone were to ring and you look to see who it is and it's your dealer, just the image of seeing their name. Uh, having your works in your hands, you know, for a lot of people, um, you know, one of the biggest th things they talk about is, I don't know what to do with my hands when I get sober. Like, you know, I'm so used to having something in my hand. I'm so used to having. A, it's one of the reasons that stopping smoking is so hard, is because all of that sensory data that you've been collecting while you were using or smoking. Um, now triggers the desire to use. It triggers dopamine so that it tricks your brain into thinking, well, we're already using, so I might as well go for it. And so um, the other thing I want to talk about is um, when guys are telling war stories in the house and people are talking about what an awesome time they had when they were using, um, it's doing the same thing. And so um, just pay attention when uh, two people are talking about using and watch how uh, excited they get and how 
um, maybe even relaxed they get in that process. And they may talk louder and they may be more uh, um, expressive. Go watch them, you know, half hour after, after that. And they're going to start being cranky and agitated because they activated the addictive process by talking about it. And then they didn't fulfill it by using it. So then the, the, the nervous system gets agitated and anxious. So that's all you need to know about these drugs is that anyone who doubts the disease process, that it is, it is truly a brain disease. And over the course of time, it hijacks this part of our brain so that it makes us believe that our thoughts are right and our beliefs are correct. And we have a process called euphoric recall that says, I don't know why everyone's mad at me. I don't remember it being that you know, big of an argument. I don't remember it. You know, everyone's making a mountain out of a molehill. But it's because the way the person remembers circumstances are very different. Um, a, 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 one guy talks about, um, it's like a computer virus. And you can't see it, you can't feel it, but it changes the way parts of your brain work just like it would in a, in a computer. The other thing that releases the exact same chemicals in the brain are these process addictions, sex. And so a lot of men, I would say probably half of the men that come into our treatment program have issues with sex, whether it be masturbation, uh, pornography, um, kind of sexual preoccupation, um, in that a lot of times they will relapse on these issues because, well, that's not why I went to treatment, and then um, their drug of choice will follow suit. Food. A lot of people gain a lot of weight in treatment because they used to use to manage their anxiety, and now they have to learn new ways to do that. So food becomes part of the uh, satisfaction because it releases dopamine into the system. Spending exercise a lot of people become like exercise addicted gambling is probably the biggest uh, threat uh, as the next addiction that we have um, um, in, in our country uh, now, now that we've legalized it so many of our younger uh, clients that come in um, have pretty significant issues with sports betting um, and then the old standard uh, of workaholism and um, I would ask you also a lot of times we'll talk about does anyone in your family have addiction and um, and so often clients will say no i'm the only one in the family that has it and then when we i, I was talking with one client who was saying you know i'm the only one that really struggles with that in my kind of um, world and when we did an assessment of their family he had an older brother who had a very significant workaholism process. Uh, he had a, another brother who had a sex addiction, had a sister with an eating disorder. He's the one that gets identified by the family as the problem because he has a, a chemical dependency. But it's when you're looking at addiction in your family, I would expand that understanding to look at these. And the reason I have the whack-a-mole game here is that the process, the term we use now is called addiction interaction disorder, which means if all of these things release dopamine, just like your drug of choice, that a lot of times as you deal with one, and you hit that, that, that mole, another one's going to pop up. So you have to be really clear about, um, even in recovery, looking at what are the things that, you know, things like Pornography, the research is saying that it really alters the brain in a very similar way to the way addiction alters the brain. Not just releasing dopamine, but altering memory, um, a minimization process. So if, if these are issues that you relate to, do not, you know, shouldn't create a, a lot of shame in that um, you know, the vast majority of clients who come for drug and alcohol addiction also have these kinds of uh, addictions as well. And um, if you relapse on these, your drug of choice is just the next mole away. So, um, so that's, you know, uh, again, 
but this would probably be a good place to stop the video and begin to talk about some of these and to see where what do you relate to in this in this slide how does this how does this work and whoever is facilitating can begin to talk about the relationship between these issues and why it's so important to address the things. Um, so, so what's recovery? How do we define it? And so often, you know, um, people make a, 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 they don't understand the difference between abstinence, sobriety, and recovery. And abstinence is just simply not using. We often talk about people who are white knuckling it and they're just holding on for dear life trying not to use but they're not really engaging in a process of change and growth and healing and so that idea of so so often and i would like you to think about this for a second so often people come in to treatment and the consequence of being in treatment and the reality of being in treatment convinces them that I got this, I got this, I will never do this again. The consequences have been so severe, um, I don't ever want to have this happen again. I probably don't need to be here any longer. I, I think I got this, I think I can go home and I can stay sober. And so what happens is um, that level of what we call a pink cloud, that idea, the term that's used in treatment, the idea of things are going to be easier than I expect them to be. Things are going to be um, you know, less pr troublesome as I expected them to be. Leads to a lack of willingness in most cases to do the really hard work of recovery, to the acceptance, dealing with the grief and loss of this best friend that you've ever had, addiction, the um, um, beginning to build self-esteem back, to look at the traumas that you've experienced. If I believe in a very short period of time, like, man, I've learned my lesson, and I don't need all of that, then when you leave treatment, um, there's a high likelihood that you're going to go into a process that we call like a dry drunk or a, a dry addiction. And that basically is saying, I haven't learned, because I didn't allow myself to dig into the difficult concepts and... and tasks of recovery when I was in treatment, now that I'm out of treatment, and you may have left treatment early and tried to get out as fast as you can, and uh, those kinds of things, that you may be trying to stay sober, or to, to remain abstinent, but you haven't learned any of the skills to do that. And so you move from pink cloud to shorten treatment to... Um, a really uncomfortable period of abstinence. And it's at that point that people either realize, well, I need, to I need to get sober, which basically means start working a process that allows you to have the skills, competencies, emotional regulation, insights, acceptance of a need to be around other people who are sober. And this is where people begin to look at the need for, some people go to church, some people go to AA or NA, some people go to secular sobriety. There's just you know, a lot of, you know, we, we are very supportive of all methods that people use to stay sober. Uh, we're pretty partial to 12-step um, uh, for a variety of reasons. I'll explain in the next slide. Um, but you get to decide. Recovery is something that's really completely different. It's sobriety as a prerequisite, meaning the ability to sit and work on um, myself, yourself, uh, work on um, you know, that level of being able to have coping skills when triggers and such happen. Um, but it's also working on these issues, working on your emotional health, uh, working on your environment, Remember, all those sensory cues that trigger uh, drug use. So one of the reasons we want so many people to go to sober living is to have a period of time away from home, i.e. the environment 
where all of the using was to reduce triggers, to reduce cravings, and to be around a, um, a group of people who are working on the same level of sobriety that you are. You know, it's not punishment. It's, it's to give your nervous system, to give your body, to give you an opportunity to develop the skills that you need to return to an environment where uh, all those cues and triggers are going to be present. Uh, getting financially healthy is part of re recovery. Um, um, you know, allowing your brain to heal and the intellect to return. Um, you know, better work, you know, physical health, social health, spiritual health, all of these things. And so uh, all of this is built on a foundation of hope. And so often people uh, will convince themselves that they don't, you know, I'm never going to get sober. So, so abstinence is not using without any skills. Sobriety is not using while embracing um, a fellowship or a group of people that can help you stay sober. And recovery is sobriety with the patience, the long-term goal of healing all of these other areas in your life. And these we often call this, if done in a wheel, the wheel of recovery or the wheel of wellness that once sobriety has taken hold, that these are the things that then come into your life uh, in the long term. And this is what clients um, will talk to us about after they've uh, been out for a year or so, where they begin to say, wow, I never imagined how good my life could be. It's still hard, there's still things I struggle with, but I'm really seeing like growth in these areas. And so the only other thing I'll say about this slide um, is that and no one likes to hear this when I say it, but I, the research is absolutely clear. If you're willing to stay in some kind of therapy, some kind of care, whether it's be becoming a regular 12-step uh, member or uh, having a therapist that you work with over the long haul or you work with, with a trauma therapist, you work with an, a relationship uh, coach, um, those kinds of things, that if you can give yourself a year in the recovery process, but certainly in the sobriety process, that you begin to see <coughs> physical healing, emotional healing, that um, allows you to make very different decisions, spiritual healing, <coughs> intellectual healing, that allows you to make very different decisions and feel present in your life. And so the last slide if you are sitting in the group room downstairs, <coughs> excuse me, and you look over your shoulder, you will see that poster on the wall. And um, <coughs> this is a poster that the clinical team created when we were on a retreat. And we were kind of looking at what are the things that we think you need to be able to do when you leave treatment? <coughs> Excuse me for all this coughing. And you'll see when you look at that poster that there are two sides. <clears throat> and one are what we call recovery milestones. That's over here on the left. And these are the things that you don't get <clears throat> immediately. These are things that take time. And so uh, we're looking at when you come into treatment to the time that you leave treatment, have you made progress in these areas? And so a commitment to abstinence. A lot of times in ongoing recovery, a lot of times people come in and they're not committed to the abstinence. They're, I'm here to appease my wife. I'm here to, you know, so I don't have to go to jail. I, um, I have charges. Um, and we see progress as you move uh, into a milestone that says, you know, I've, I've kind of learned since I've been here that my life actually would be better if I would do this. What everyone has said is accurate, and I need to address it. <clears throat> the second one is connecting consequences of your addiction, of your chemical use, <coughs> onto all of these areas of your life, and beginning to make the connection that, <clears throat> you know, since I started using as a kid, 
and maybe even before that, maybe developmental trauma uh, that you um, experienced as a child, or ACEs, or uh, adverse childhood events, or <clears throat> because parents were uh, impacted by their own addiction or their family member's addiction, that attachment was never really um, created, like a healthy attachment. That your own personal identity, like knowing who you are, being allowed to say what you really believe, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, <clears throat> to be honest, and have rigorous honesty. Uh, looking at family issues and social relationships, people you've hurt, people who, who have hurt you, resentments that you hold, and beginning to look at how they evolved, not you know, how they evolved out of this life of addiction. Uh, grief and loss. Um, um, in the days when I've seen clients, I always like for them to write a, a goodbye letter to their addiction because it's like their best friend. It's the thing that they've always leaned on when things got tough, even though it was what created a lot of the tough. Uh, Co-occurring disorders, beginning to look at, at you know, is there a, a depression? Do I actually have trauma that I've been sort of self-medicating? Those process addictions that we were talking about, all you know, the, the sex addictions and food and spending and exercise, do you have those uh, addiction processes? And then chronic pain or other medical complications. And again, at the, when you come into treatment, you know, they don't always recognize that this isn't just quitting. This is a process of immer immersing oneself in a growth process, in a learning process, in a connection process that allows them to move from abstinence to sobriety to recovery. And then learning recovery concepts. What does it mean to be powerless? It doesn't mean helpless. There are certain things that no matter how hard we try, we can't do. And if you've tried a thousand times to stop and you just haven't been able to do it, then maybe maybe there's something about that like the disease process that keeps you stuck in, a, in, in an attempt that becomes unmanageable so that you keep trying to do something that maybe the most appropriate <coughs> coping strategy would be to quit trying to make that go away acceptance that this problem is there rigorous honesty a lot of times people don't like rigorous honesty because it you know, gets them into deeper trouble. <laughs> you know, the, the, so you know, I think the facilitator can talk maybe a little bit more about rigorous honesty, but um, it's been my experience, and particularly in working with the family program, as individuals and a couple become more rigorously honest, and that doesn't mean brutally honest, that means consistently honest, that it gets easier, and they begin to understand where the other person is at. And so, um, you know, this isn't just for recovery from addiction. This is a part of healing um, one's life. This is a part of re recovery. Uh, wrestling with issues of higher power and spirituality. If my trauma is associated with, um, you know, some aspect of religion, I get it. If it's I'm smarter than everyone else, and therefore you know, God doesn't exist. Oops, I don't know if God exists either. Um, <clears throat> I have my own beliefs. But this idea of, <clears throat> you know, could a higher power be the group? Could a higher power be um, depending on others, being able to ask for help? You know, there's, there's a lot of this that can be negotiated and kind of wrestled with to get you what you need. <clears throat> Becoming open to needing continuing care. We're going to always recommend that you go to continuing care. That's not a, it's, it's not something that we will ever say, wow, this guy is so good, he doesn't need to go to IOP. That's not how it works. <clears throat> and then being able to connect to others, get needs met, begin to learn how to trust, live within boundaries. I said earlier in this, in this video <clears throat> why I really like 12-step programs. And I really like them as much for the message, but also as much for the fellowship that it creates and allows people who have trauma to connect to other people, to ask for help, 
It allows them to, to live in a set of rules and boundaries that tell them, if you do these things, you're more likely to succeed. To identify what needs they really have. And not just what they want, but what they really need. And then how to trust other people. The other side of this poster is talking about treatment objectives. These are the things that we're trying to do with you um, to help you um, kind of learn why you're here. Um, be able to identify your feelings without judging them. Well, I sh I've always been told I shouldn't feel that way. Or my anger is really inappropriate. <clears throat> or quit acting like a victim. Um, quit feeling sorry for yourself. And so a lot of times <clears throat> when people do begin to identify feelings, that the old judgments of parents of, or self-punitive... How many of you have a schema of self-punitiveness? This is really an example of that self-punitiveness. I feel something and then I berate myself for that. Be able to regulate your emotions. Um, <clears throat> be able to take the coping skills that you're learning in uh, the coping <clears throat> skills groups and really begin to implement them. Be able to ask for help in the house, with your family, in 12 steps. And that's really the beginning of a process of humility. The idea of, <clears throat> um, I call it um, um, functional dependence. The idea of if you can do it yourself without help and be successful, great, go for it. But if you can't, if you're still learning to ask for others' help, as a process of humility. Not humiliation, but being humble and knowing what I can do and what I can't do. Be able to identify cravings and triggers. It always makes me laugh a little bit when clients will say, well, I'm having them, but I'm not going to tell you because that just means you'll keep me here longer. And I can't tell you how many clients have told me that. <clears throat> if we look at the biology that we talked about and how sensory experience triggers the release of certain chemicals, those chemicals are what creates craving. And it's the triggers. Uh, if you're sitting around talking about using, if you are doing that, you should have cravings. That's biologically how it works. And so um, a lot of times talking in a session, working hard with your therapist will create triggers and cravings. Uh, being okay with not being okay. Being able to cry. Being able to be upset and be frustrated without screaming at everybody without <clears throat> you know, projecting it all out on everybody, but really allowing yourself to feel what you feel. I have awareness of 12-step principles, um, <clears throat> personal insights, um, what, what, what do you struggle with? I uh, have a clear understanding of the difference between abstinence, sobriety, and recovery. And then end black and white thinking. Be open to new information, curious about your own, like, why do I think that way? That, when I'm doing therapy, I'm always at helping people look at inconsistencies in the way they think and helping them begin to say, well, what's different about the times when I'm feeling this and the times I'm feeling this and um, those kinds of things. So, uh, again, this would be a, an awesome time for the facilitator to kind of <clears throat> just leave this up on the board for a few minutes and answer questions, begin to you know, process um, like where in our curriculum, where in our treatment, you know, some of these things are kind of focusing. But um, so I hope this has been helpful. Um, and thanks for um, for paying attention. I, I appreciate it. Okay. Good job. Thanks. Isn't that the stuff you think?